class. Welcome back to episode five of Math 1050 College Algebra. I'm Dennis Allison here in the math department at Utah Valley State College. And today we're going to talk about uh, two big topics. The first one is using functions as models. Uh, and the other one is on direct and inverse variation. So let's begin by looking at functions and models. And uh, let's go to the first graphic that says the graph of a function can tell a story. Uh, in this case, it becomes a, quote, model for the application. Now let's take an example, go to the next graphic here. We actually saw this, this same problem uh, several episodes back, but I just kind of want to remind you how this goes. Uh, this is, the, uh, this is a, a graph of a salesman's distance from home. So uh, you see it starts off at 8 a.m., he's at home, and uh, by 9 o'clock he's a certain distance away from home. And um, it looks like between 9 and 10 he stopped, maybe for breakfast, maybe he stopped at his office. Uh, but then he, then he travels on between uh, 10 and noon. He travels in a linear fashion, we might point out, and he stops between 12 and 1, perhaps he had lunch. Then he's traveling again between noon and, uh, noon and 5 o'clock. He gets a little closer to home, then he travels further away. And then he stopped between 6 and 7, perhaps for dinner. And then he comes home in a hurry. So you see, here's a graph of a function that is a model for a story. And when you look at the graph, you can, you can interpret the story. We don't know that we have all the details right. We don't know if he stopped for dinner from 6 to 7, but it looks like he was stopped anyway. Let's go to the next graphic. Uh, here's a new one. This one says, uh, a homeowner mows the lawn every Wednesday afternoon. Sketch the graph of the height of the grass as a function of time over a four-week period beginning with Sunday. Well, you see, beginning on Sunday, the grass uh, has some height to it, but it keeps growing until Wednesday, and that's when the homeowner mows the grass, and then the height drops back down, and then the grass starts growing until the next Wednesday. Then it gets mowed again. So you see, this graph is chop up, chopped up into pieces. Uh, does that graph, rep would, would that graph uh, be a function? Does it represent a function? Well, let's see, it has to pass the vertical line test. Does it pass the vertical line test? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, every vertical line seems to intersect it no more than once. Uh, why is it that uh, it, the graphs, those little uh, branches, don't start off at zero? What would be your explanation for that? Jenny? You don't shave your graph off, grass off completely. You have to leave about a half an inch there. Yeah, exactly. So you have to leave a little bit of grass. You don't cut it right down to the ground. So, uh, so the graph starts off, those, those branches start off a little bit higher than zero. But then it seems to grow in a linear fashion. Now, of course, when I say a function is a model, this is, uh, this is not an exact model of the grass because I doubt if grass grows in a perfectly linear fashion. If you get rainfall, grass grows faster. If you're in a drought, grass may grow slower. So this, is, uh, this model... Uh, is supposed to represent, but not perfectly, uh, the growth of the grass. By the way, it's said to grow this, or to represent this for a four week interval, and actually it looks like I've only drawn about a three and a half week interval. So I should put an extra uh, short branch coming out of the, the right hand Wednesday uh, if I were actually gonna show four weeks. Okay, let's go to the next, the next graphic. Here's a, here's a quite different problem. This time we have an illustration, but we don't have a graph. It says a property owner uses 120 feet of fencing to make a rectangular garden beside her garage. So you see the, the garage is represented, which is sort of a bird's eye view. The garage is on the left. Uh, we have the rectangular garden. We come out X yards on each side. And the perimeter of the three sides is 120 feet. Now the questions say, first of all, find the four-sided perimeter. We'll call that function P of X, P for perimeter and then find the area a of x. So we're going to choose the function, name the function a for area. So let's try solving this on, on the green board. I'm going to draw that illustration up here. Uh, here's the garage. We're going to come out, down, and back. And we know that we have uh, 120 yards all together of fencing. And I'm going to call this x, call this x. So if I put x yards here and x yards here, how many yards are left over for this side? Stephen? 120 minus 2x. 120 minus 2x, yes. And I think I'm running out of room there, so I'll, put it, I'll write it over here. 120 minus 2x. So part A asks us to find the function p of x, which is the perimeter of the garden. Now that's for all four sides. So the perimeter, 
I'd have to add up x and 120 minus 2x and x and another 120 minus 2x, even though there's no fencing here, it's part of the perimeter. So that's going to be um, x. Actually, I'll have two of those x's. Why don't I put 2x there? And I also have two of the 120 minus 2x's. 2 times 120 minus 2x. Now, that is the function p of x, but it's just, uh, it's just begging us to simplify it. So let's go ahead and do that. So that'll be 2x plus 240 minus 4x. And that's a total of 240 minus 2x. And uh, what units would I put on that? Yards. Yards, OK. So uh, that would be 240 minus 2x yards. So that is the function uh, rule for the, for the uh, perimeter. Now, you see, what this means is if you tell me how much x is, like if you tell me x is 10, if I plug in a 10 here, that'll tell me what the perimeter of the garden is. Let's just see. p at 10 would be uh, 240 minus 2 times 10 minus 20 is 220 yards. That's the total perimeter. Now, you remember we only have 120 feet of fencing, but the perimeter of the garden is 220 yards. That would be 10 and 10. How much would this side be? 100. Oh, 100, and this would be 100. So 10 and 10 and 100 and 100 is 220 yards. On the other hand, what if we chose x to be 50? Well, then this would be 240 minus 2 times x, that'll be 100, and I get 140 yards for the total perimeter. That would be 50 and 50, and um, what would this be? 20. 20 and 20, 50 and 50, and 20 and 20. Sure enough, that's 140 yards. Now you might say, well, Dennis, look, if you can figure out those answers just by pointing at it, 50 and 50 and 20 and 20, what's the purpose of this? Well, now I have a general representation for all possible for all perimeters, for all possible x's. Uh, by the way, there is a restriction on the domain of this function because x can't just be any number. Uh, one restriction, for example, is that x can't be negative. So we know that the x's here have to be positive numbers because you can't have a negative dimension on a garden. On the other hand, what's the biggest x could be? That's kind of a tricky one. Let's say we have 120 feet of fencing. So if I go straight out and straight back, how much would x be? 60. It'd be 60. 60. So x can't be bigger than 60. If I go out 70, I don't have enough fencing to even come back. So the biggest x could be, would be, uh, would be 60. And it, as a matter of fact, you might even argue that 60 isn't allowable because that's not really a rectangle. If you go out 60 and back 60, you just have a line segment with zero area enclosed. But we'll include those as sort of the extreme possibilities. And I would say that the domain of this function is restricted, and that is the domain is zero to 60. Uh, the reason I point that out is we mentioned in the uh, first episode, I think it was, that if there's no mention of a restriction on the domain, we assume the domain allow is every allowable number. Well, you see, this function allows every possible number to give you an answer. It just it doesn't make sense in this physical application. So we have this, this smaller domain. Uh, part B of the same problem says find the area of that garden. So let's do that now. Uh, we call this function a of x. Once again, the garden looked like this. We come out x, and we said that this side was, uh, oh, this is x down here. We said this side is 120 minus 2x. So what would be the area of the garden? Uh, Susan, what would you say is the area? Um, x times 120 minus 2x. Exactly. x times 120 minus 2x. Now, we could leave the answer like that, but why don't we multiply it out? And this says that um, a of x will be 120x minus 2x squared. If you want to turn that around and put the x squared first, you could say minus 2x squared plus 120x. It doesn't really matter which way you write it, 
But in either case, this is not a linear function because it's not in the form f of x equals mx plus b. It has this x squared term in it. So this sort of a function is called a quadratic function. Um, you remember you've solved quadratic equations before. Well, this is a quadratic uh, function. Uh, can anyone tell me what would be the area of the garden if we chose x to be um, 15? That was out my calculator. Well, let's see. Let's see how we do that. Now, we could plug in a 15 here and here. We'd have to square the 15. We'd have to multiply 15 times 120. We could plug in the 15 here and here. That would be essentially the same thing. Or we could plug in the 15 up there. So why don't we go to that first version, because I think it'll be simpler to multiply. If I put in a 15 for x, and then if I put in a 15 here, that'll be a 120 minus 30. How much is that? 90. 90, OK. So what I need to do is take 90 times 15. Let's see, 15 times 90 is going to be uh, 0, 5, 1, 3. So that'll be 1350, 1,350. And what are the units on that answer? Yard squared. Yard squared, exactly, because we're talking about area. So this gives me yard squared because it's an area function. Uh, you notice that the name of the function is not f of x because f is sort of a, a generic name for function. In this case, the area has, or the, the function has a certain meaning, so what I choose is a letter to allow me to remember what this function is. P for perimeter, A for area, 1,350 yards in this case. Okay, let's go to the next graphic. Uh, this next problem is actually a rather famous one. It was first solved by Galileo. Let me write his name up here. Uh, Galileo. Uh, Galileo was born in 1564 and he died in 1642. And Galileo was the first mathematician to notice that the height of a projectile, if you throw it up into the air, uh, would obey a quadratic function. Here's what he discovered. If you look at, uh, if we go back to that graphic, you see if we have a building, let's say we're standing on top of that building, and uh, let's say the building is h sub 0 tall. There's a h sub 0 in that equation that you see there. That's how tall the building is. And let's say you throw the object up in the air with an initial speed, which I call v sub 0. Uh, then the height of the ball can be calculated by the formula you see on the screen. Let me just write that up here. Uh, capital H of t. Uh, why do you think I'm calling the function capital H? For height. For height, OK. Is equal to minus. 16t squared plus v sub 0 t plus h sub 0. Now, the number h sub 0 is your initial height. That's why it's h sub 0. It's your height that times 0 when you first release the object. Uh, v sub 0 is the initial speed. If you throw the object up in the air, the initial speed is positive. And if you throw the object down, I'd call this negative, in which case it's actually velocity. And the minus 16, well, now that's the strangest part of all. This has to do with the acceleration of gravity. If I were to solve this problem, let's say, on the moon, where the acceleration of gravity is different because you weigh less on the moon, I'd put a different number there. The minus 16 is, stays the same because we're, we're doing all of our problems here on the Earth, luckily, so we don't have to worry about other, other accelerations of gravity. Um, OK, let's go to the problem that follows the graphic of the building. Uh, it says that a ball is tossed upward from a 240-foot building at a speed of 32 feet per second. And there are three questions that we ask. First of all, find the function h of t. Well, we have the general form of the function here on our green board. Part B says, how high will the ball be after four seconds? Part C, when will the ball strike the ground? And part D, what is the domain of the function h? OK, let's come back to the green screen and take a look at those one at a time. The first question was to find the function h of t for this particular problem. So this function is going to be a model of that, of that problem. Uh, let's see. So we start off minus 16t squared plus the initial speed v sub 0. Do you remember what the initial speed was? 32 feet per second. 32 feet per second, exactly. And you remember what the height of the building was? 240. 240 feet, yes. Uh, you know, by the way, before I go on, let me just mention, for those of you at home taking notes on this, 
Uh, all of these problems are worked out in detail on the website. So if I, if I give you a value like the height of the building and you say, wait a minute, I, didn't, I don't remember what he said the height was. If you look on the website, you'll see a full discussion of this problem and all the others that we've done. And uh, you can check the numbers and you can look at that more slowly than uh, listening to me explain it here uh, verbally. Okay, so this is the function that describes the height of the ball at time t. Now, the second question was, how high is the ball after four seconds? Well, t represents time in seconds, so I'm going to substitute in a four for t, and this answer is going to be given in feet. That's going to be the height of the ball in feet. Well, if I substitute in 4, that's going to be a minus 16 times 4 squared, that's 16, plus 32 times 4, plus 240. Now, we just have to simplify that. Uh, 16 times 16 is 256, that's a minus 256, plus uh, 4 times 32 is 120, what, 128, 128, thank you plus 240. Well, why don't we combine those two together? Those are real easy to combine. Negative, two, negative 256 plus 240, that's a minus 16 plus 128. And so 128 subtract 16 is how much? 112. 112, right. So that's 112 feet. So the ball is 112 feet in the air. Now, let me just... Uh, erase some of this, and let's just look at the illustration of that building. I'm going I'm to draw the building here on the graphic. Let's keep in mind that after four seconds, the ball is 112 feet in the air. And um, so if this is the building, and if this is, the, this is where we're standing initially at h sub zero, we throw it up in the air, and then it comes back down, and it's on the way to the ground, so uh, this altitude, if I make a vertical axis right here, this would be 240, because that's our initial height. Now, of course, the ball goes higher than that for a while, but then it comes back down. After four seconds, it's 112 feet off the ground. 112 would be, I'll estimate it, right about there. So after four seconds, the ball is right here. I'm going to say t equals 4, which means that it has already gone up to its maximum, it's on the way back down, it's traveling downward, but it hasn't reached the ground yet because its height isn't zero. So the ball's right about there. Now, if you were to actually carry out this, this experiment, if you went to the top of a building that was 240 feet high, and if you could throw the ball up in the air at exactly 32 feet per second, straight up, and if you allowed it to come down the side, it probably wouldn't be exactly there. Uh, do you know, do you know what, what other effects would influence the progress of the projectile? Air resistance. There'd be air resistance. So you know what happens is the ball actually slows down. It probably wouldn't go quite that high because of air resistance. And it would probably accelerate not quite at the, at the acceleration that Galileo predicted because his formula is actually intended to work in a vacuum. But we're not in a vacuum. When you throw the object in the air, there's air resistance. But this is a very close approximation. That's why I'm saying this function h of t is a model for the application. It's not the exact representation of it, but it's close enough for our, our purposes, say, in a physics course. Uh, the next question we asked related to this problem was when does it hit the ground? Let's see, let me just write in our function for this particular situation. We said it was minus 16 t squared plus 32 t plus 240. Now, how are we going to find out when it hits the ground? That's question C. Any suggestions? Jenny? When h equals zero? Exactly. When the height is zero, it's on the ground. So I'm going to put a zero right here. And what I have now is a quadratic equation. We had a quadratic function. Now we have a quadratic equation. Uh, there are several ways to solve this, but if we can factor it, I think that's the quickest way to do it. The trouble is there's a negative 16 coefficient. Why don't we divide that out? I think 16 divides all of these. I'm going to divide by a negative 16. Of course, I even divide the 0 by negative 16, and I get a 0. This will be a t squared. What will this be? Negative 2. Negative 2t, two yep. And this one will be a negative, let's see, 16 into 24, 1. 
16 to 85, that's a minus 15. That looks a whole lot nicer. Now, of course, this equation is different than the previous equation, but what they have in common is they have the same solution. So I've actually made a transformation in the equation to a simpler form, and now I'm going to solve this one. Just like last time we made trans transformations in graphs, here I'm making a transformation in an equation. I can factor that into, let's see, t, t. This sign's a negative. That tells me something's positive, something's negative. Has anyone figured out what those numbers would be? Three and five. Three and five. Yeah, I think we want to put the five with the negative, put the three with the positive. And if this product is zero, one of the factors is zero. So either t plus three is zero, or t minus five is zero. So either t equals negative three, hey, what's that all about? <laughs> or t is equal to five seconds. Of course, this is the answer that we'll want to choose. It hits the ground in five seconds. You remember it was 112 feet off the ground after four seconds. In one more second, it should be on the ground. Now, why did we get a negative three? What does that mean? Well, you know, if I go back and draw the illustration of the building, I think we can see where that comes from. In this problem, the algebra doesn't know that the problem begins when t is zero. So we said we release the ball at time t equals zero, it goes up, and then it comes down to the ground. Well, for all the algebra knows, we released it prior to time zero. We released it at maybe negative one second, maybe negative two seconds, maybe negative three seconds we were on the ground. So three seconds prior to the release of the ball on the top of the building, we could have been on the ground and thrown it much faster, and it would have followed the same path, and it would have gone up to that peak and come back down. So the algebra gives us every possible answer, and it, allow, it, it asks us to figure out what answer we want. So we're going to take the answer t equals 5, and we're going to reject the answer t equals negative 3 seconds, because we know this problem began at the moment when t was 0. But the algebra doesn't know that we don't want that, so it gives us every answer. Now, we have one more application I'd like to look at. This one involves an interview with an oral motorcycle policeman. So let's go to that tape. Well, class, we've been discussing how functions are used as models in our college algebra class. And so I've called uh, Officer uh, Gaines from the Orem Police Department, who's going to show us how his radar gun works. And we'll go back to the classroom, and we'll talk about how we can make a, math make a mathematical function that models the radar gun. So Officer Gaines, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, basically, we use two different types of radars. One is um, one that we use in our car, which uses radio frequencies. The other one is uh, the one I have here, which uses uh, a laser or a light frequencies to, to figure out the speed. Um, basically, uh, the difference in the two is um, with the radio frequency, that's sending um, uh, the radio frequency out. It's hitting the object and coming back into the, to the radar. The radar is taking the change in that frequency or the change in that wavelength uh, to, to figure out the speed in miles per hour. Uh, we can use that uh, u unit when we're either moving down the road or when we're stopped. Um, if we're moving down the road, then our, um, the speed we're traveling uh, plays an effect in that the way it figures out that speed. It needs to take that speed out of there uh, so it comes up with an accurate speed of the target vehicle. Um, with the LiDAR, uh, the big difference is, one, we can, we, it, it's using a light wave and it's sending out pulses of light at about 600 pulses per second. Uh, it's hitting an object and returning back into the unit. When it returns, it, the unit uses that time it lapsed to uh, calculate the speed and convert that into miles per hour. The one disadvantage to this unit is that we have to be stationary or stop to use it, so we can't uh, be driving down the road to use it. The other, the other benefit of this one, obviously when you're using a radio frequency, it's going out there and getting wider and wider, and we, there's some other steps as, as an officer to make to, that you have to use in order to make sure you're getting an accurate, an accurate reading. With the LiDAR, the beam width at 1,000 feet is only about uh, 12 inches wide, so we can place the, the LiDAR unit on a particular object, whether it's a person, bike, car, whatever, and we know that's the reading we're getting is from that particular uh, it, uh, object. Okay, with this unit, um, it tells us both the speed and the distance uh, the object is from us, um, and then you'll see either a plus or minus next to that number, which lets us know if it, the vehicle is coming towards us or going away from us. Um, the the ins, what I'm using inside this uh, unit here is just a small red dot 
so that I can use it to, to, to point it at the uh, object or the um, I, what I want to get the speed from. And you can see as the speed changes in the unit, um, it changes in the speed here as well as it giving us the distance. And again, there's the uh, plus sign, which is telling us that uh, object was coming towards our location. Okay, now uh, you notice he said there are actually two different types of radar guns. The, the one that's mounted in a, in a police car, uh, you can actually be traveling while you're using that radar gun, and it's, it's tied to the, the uh, speedometer of the car, so it makes an adjustment for the speed of the police car. And they can clock you whether you're going away or toward them. But with this, with this uh, radar gun that he has, it works on a different principle, and he has to be sitting stationary, and uh, he has to be looking right at you. You have to be coming right at him. If he moves off to the side, like at a 30 degree, 45 degree angle, then your speed will be registered as too slow. So that's why they step out in the middle of the street and they look right at you to get an accurate reading. And if you think, well, if they're on the side, maybe I'm going to be, they're going to think I'm going faster. No, actually, they'll think you're going slower. So, um, so there'll, there'll be a difference there. And in fact, that uses something he calls the cosine effect that we'll talk about in Math 1060. Uh, well, let's take a look at the, at the radar gun that the motorcycle officer is using. And the principle is that it sends out pulses of light. He said 600 per second. And that light bounces off the car, comes back to the radar gun. So it takes two different readings. First, it sends out a pulse, see how long it takes for it to come back. Then it, then it takes another pulse sometime later and bounces off the car, comes back. And now it's not going to take as long if the car is coming, coming toward him. And so by measuring the, dist or the, or the change in the time intervals of those two pulses, uh, he can determine what your speed is. OK, let's say the officer is standing right here. We're sort of a bird's eye view. The officer is standing along this line. And your car is over here moving toward the officer. So the officer points the radar gun at you, sends out a radar beam that goes out, hits the car, and comes back uh, in a total of T1 seconds. And let's say at that moment you're a distance of D1 miles away. And then in a short length of time, you've moved closer to the officer. You're still moving toward the officer. And now the radar gun sends out a second pulse that goes out and hits the car, comes back. But this time, this will be a little bit shorter, so we'll call this T2 seconds. And let's say at this moment, you're D2 miles away. Now, clearly, T1 is bigger than T2 because it takes longer for the first pulse to go out and hit the car than the second pulse. And also that D1 is bigger than D2. And let's say for the sake of argument that the second pulse is sent out, uh, let's say, one-tenth of a second after the first pulse is sent out. So I'm going to assume uh, 0.1 seconds is the uh, delay for this second pulse. OK. So let's see. Now, why is D1 bigger than D2? Well, your car has moved a little bit closer uh, in that time interval, in the time interval of one-tenth of a second. So I'm going to use the formula rate times time equals distance. You've used this formula a number of times in other courses, al algebra courses and uh, maybe some science courses as well. So I'm thinking that, the, that the, this distance could be measured by the rate of the car, which is your velocity, times the amount of time that's lapsed between this moment and that moment. And that's the same as the uh, difference between the two pulses, pulse emanations. And that would be one-tenth of a second. So that would equal um, the distance travel. I'll call that delta, delta D. OK, so how can we put all of this information together? Oh, there's one more thing I want to mention. Let's say that C is the speed of the light, or the speed of the radar. Now, if, if this is actually the speed of light, then this would be 186,000 miles per second. Uh, and that, that is, uh, I would assume, to be the, the same as the speed of the radar beam in the, in the gun at the same time. OK, so what can we say about this? Well, I know that D1 is equal to D2 plus the distance traveled by the car. And the distance traveled by the car was 0 0.1 times v, v being your, your uh, velocity in this case. So if I solve for v, I'll need to subtract d2 from both sides. So let me turn this all around and say 1 tenth v is equal to uh, d1 minus d2. 
Now I know that D1 can also be computed by the formula rate times time is distance. D1 would be the amount of time it takes for the, for the radar beam to go from the officer to the car times the speed of the radar gun. So if I substitute in here, the amount of time it takes for the beam to go from the officer to the car would be T1 over 2. Now, why, is, uh, why am I taking half of that? Well, you see T1 is the total round trip time, so T1 over 2 is the time it takes to travel strictly to the car. And I multiply it by the speed of the radar, gu of the radar beam, and we're assuming that's C down here. Minus D2, well, let's see, now D2, that would be uh, distance times, or that would be rate times time, and the time would be D2 over 2 times C once again. So if I simplify this a little bit, I have 0.1V is equal to uh, C T1 over 2 minus C T2 over 2. And if I get a common denominator, I can put it all over 2. And if I factor out the C, then I have uh, T1 minus T2, C times T1 minus T2 all over T. Now, the, dif the difference between those two time amounts I'll call delta T. And so this is C times delta T over 2. Now, delta T is the difference in the readings between uh, the first impulse coming back and the second impulse coming back. We call that delta T. Okay, and over on this side, this is one-tenth times V. So if I multiply both sides by 10, then I have V is equal to uh, 10 times this quantity, and let's see, the 2 will cancel out, so I'll get 5C times delta T. Now you see C is a constant, it's the speed of the light, and therefore my velocity is a function of only one variable, and that th that's the difference between the two uh, time readings on the radar gun. So I assume what happens is when the radar gun first sends out a signal and it comes back, it measures the distance or the, it measures the time, um, the time it takes for the first radar beam to come back and then it measures the time interval for the second radar beam to come back and it takes a difference in those two times and that's what we're referring to here as delta T. Okay, you know, maybe we can distract the police officer next time you get pulled over with an argument like this. But uh, for now, I think we better move on to a new topic. Let's look at variation. As a matter of fact, here's direct variation. There are three types of variation. There's direct variation, which you see on the screen. There's also inverse variation, and then there's compound variation. So let's discuss these one at a time. Uh, two quantities, x and y, if they're related by the equation y equals k times x, where k is a non-zero constant, those two variables are said to vary directly with one another. Let me just write that on the screen. Uh, if I have two variables, x and y, and if I tell you that y is just some constant multiple of x, this is where k is not zero, but it's a constant, then I say that y varies directly with X. There's an abbreviation for that. You may have seen this in some science books before. If I put a little wiggly sign in here, Y is proportional to X, then what that means is there's a constant I can multiply X by so that Y is equal to a constant times X. And the constant K in this case, K is the constant of proportionality. The constant of proportionality. Let's go to the next graphic, and I'll show you some examples of things that, are, that vary directly. Uh, first of all, suppose a car is driven at a constant speed. Then the distance d that it travels varies directly with the time t that you drive the car. In other words, t is equal to k times t. d is equal to k times t. Now, in this case, k represents the speed of the car, or the rate, because distance equals rate times time. You see, if you drive at a constant speed, then your, then your uh, speed is constant. That's what the k is, d equals k times t. In another example, uh, this is called Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law says 
that uh, force is equal to k times x. This has to do with uh, two weights suspended from springs. And I'm going to set up a model that demonstrates this, that demonstrates Hooke's law from our, from our physics lab. Um, I'm going to hang two springs from these hooks. Um, there's one, and uh, there's one. And at the moment, you'll, uh, if the camera can zoom in on this, you'll see that there's a gradation. I think maybe I better turn this one around so we can see those better. Uh, you'll see that there's a scaling along here that goes from 0, then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, down to 2.0, I think it is. And uh, there's a little marker on this, on this spring, if you can see that right there going up and down, and that comes up to 0. Same thing on the other one. Now, I'm going to take two masses and hang them from these springs. This first mass is 100 grams. And that pulls the spring down. Um, I think you have to look a little higher to see the scale. It pulls it down to a mark just above 1.0 right here. There's, there's a mark right here, not quite 1.0. Now, the second mass I hang on the second spring has twice the mass. It's 200 grams. And it pulls the spring down twice as far. This time, the marker comes down to just above 2.0. That one was just above 1.0. This one's just above 2.0. Now, you see what's happened is, when I put on twice the mass, I get twice the stretch. Now, the mass is equivalent to saying, I put on twice the force, or the weight, over here. And so, twice the force stretches it twice as far. Now, this relationship is called Hooke's Law. Let's go back to the green screen, and I'll show you how to represent this uh, mathematically. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's, let's go to the next graphic. I think we have an illustration of this that would be helpful. Uh, on the left there, we see a spring that's unstretched. And then on the right, we see a circle that represents uh, a force, F, suspended from that spring. And it stretches it, it stretches at a distance, X. Now, the fact is that the force is proportional or, direct, or varies directly with the distance, X. So if I were to double the force, I would double the stretch. If I triple the stretch, I would triple the force. So I can make this an equation by saying F equals kx. This is where k is a constant. And so therefore, F becomes a function of x. It's equal to a constant multiple of x. Now, the constant in this case, in this application, is referred to as the spring constant. k is called the spring constant. And every spring has a different constant to it. Uh, for example, if you look at the springs in your, the, the back of your car, so that if you go over a bump, the springs absorb the, the shock there, uh, those have a very high spring constant because it takes a huge force to stretch it just a little bit. On the other hand, the springs that we have right here, it didn't take that much force or weight to stretch it fairly far, so the spring constant on these springs is relatively small. Okay, let's look at another uh, application of direct variation, and we have this on a, with an interview, another interview, this with one of our physics professors, Dr. Paul Mills of the physics department. Let's, let's show that interview. Well, college algebra students, uh, we're in the sacred halls of the science building here at UVSC, and uh, this is Dr. Paul Mills of the physics department, and he's going to show us some uh, applications of our recent uh, discussion of variation, direct and inverse variation. So Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, Isaac Newton pointed out that an object that starts moving has an inertia, as he called it, or a perseverance in trying to keep going. And the mathematical way of describing that perseverance that the object has in wanting to keep moving is in the form of a 
the perseverance of this thing is equal to the mass times the velocity, or we call it the momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity. In this kind of a relationship, if you increase either one of these, you have a lot of perseverance in wanting to keep going. And we have a range for a little demonstration of this. We're going to start with a very small mass, a ping pong ball, and we're going to get it moving really fast, and we'll look at its perseverance. This is what I call a mosquito killer. Uh, it's got a cap in here that's going to ignite, and it's going to uh, produce hot gases, which will then expand really fast, and that will drive this ping pong ball out the end. And mosquito killer. And it will take off moving at really high velocity. Okay. If this goes right, it will not hit you. Okay. Now you better get a little closer. I'm not that good of a shot. These lined up, and hope you don't fall into the plant there. Are we ready? Whoa. Okay. Hold your papers up. You can see that that ping pong ball just wanted to keep going. It didn't want to stop. It coasted right through both pieces of paper and it kept going until it hit the wall over on the other side. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Okay, that Now, you know, that's the same principle uh, that uh, you might have uh, heard a reference to, say, after a hurricane. Say, if a hurricane goes through Florida, sometimes they, they find straw embedded straight into a telephone pole. You wonder, how could you take a piece of straw and stick it into a telephone pole like that? But the straw is going so fast, it has very little mass, but it has such high velocity that if it hits the telephone pole straight on, rather than shattering the straw, it actually sticks into the telephone pole. So they, they see examples of these things now and then. Uh, the formula that he wrote was that perseverance, he called it, is equal to mass times the velocity. Now, if we think of uh, the mass as being the constant, you remember, uh, we had uh, y equals kx. So if we think of this as being the constant, then we can say that the perseverance is directly, uh, varies directly with the velocity. So as the velocity gets bigger, so does the perseverance. Now in this case, when he fired the ping pong ball out of that little gun, it had such a high velocity, even though it didn't have that much mass, it had such a high velocity, it had a lot of perseverance, and it persevered with the effect that it went right through the two sheets of paper. It didn't split them from top to bottom, it just split them open in one little, little spot. So that was his example for perseverance. Um, okay, now another type of variation is inverse variation. Let's go to the next graphic. We have this for the screen. Instead of direct variation, inverse variation says that if x and y are related by the equation uh, y is equal to x, uh, y is equal to k over, that should be x, not a p, y equals x over, uh, y equals k over x, where k not zero is a constant, then y varies inversely with x. I probably had p on my mind when I wrote that because I'd just seen the perseverance. Uh, here's an example. If total sales s, let's say you have a company, total sales s varies inversely with the unit price p, if that happens, then we say, uh, S equals K over P. Now, uh, as you might imagine, what if you're selling, uh, what if you're selling CDs, and what if you double the price of the CDs? Wouldn't that make the sales probably go down? Now, if it goes down in such a way that when you double the sales price, you cut the sales in half. If you triple the sales price, you cut the sales down to one third. In other words, as one goes up, the other one goes down, and they, then that's said to be inverse variation. In this case, I said that the sales would equal K over the sales price. Now, it's not always the case that just because the price doubles, the sales price is cut in half. But if that were to be the case, then we would say that S varies inversely with P. with P. Now, we have a physical model that will demonstrate this for us. So uh, let's just take a break while I set up this demonstration and we'll come right back. Okay, uh, we had to take a break there so we could set up this apparatus, but now I want to demonstrate a property of pendulums. And uh, in this case, the pendulums are basically two strings with masses hanging from the ends. One of them is very short, one of them is fairly long. Uh, actually, when I set this up, I should have gotten two masses that were exactly alike. But uh, the mass up here is a little bit smaller. But it turns out the mass doesn't affect the period of the pendulum when it oscillates. It's the length of the string that affects how long it takes the pendulum to go back and forth. Um, 
So uh, the first string is 20 centimeters long, the first pendulum. The other one is 80 centimeters long. So in other words, this one is four times longer than the other one. And we're going to see how that affects the period. Now you notice when I displace this one, it has a fairly short period. It only takes a short time for it to make one complete oscillation. That's what I mean by the period. On the other hand, this one, when I displace it a small amount, it has a longer period. It takes a longer amount of time to make one complete oscillation. Now, how are they related? Well, it turns out that these two quantities vary directly. These vary directly. Um, OK, so let's see what happens. If I pull these out, I'm going to release them at the same time. Uh, the one up above, I believe, will make two oscillations in the amount of time this one makes one oscillation. So here we go. Whoop, oh, I didn't quite release it straight. OK. One, two, one, two. Whoops, I touched that one. Sorry about that. But I think you are, I think you will see that this one, let me turn this like so. And uh, I think this camera in front of us may be able to pick it up. Um, OK, so one, two, one, two, one, two, one, Two. And uh, it, that should progress indefinitely. So what we have here, if we go to our green board, is that the, if I call T the period of a pendulum, then, uh, and if I let L be the length of the pendulum, that would be the length of the string. Actually, it's the distance from the pivot down to the center of gravity of the weight. So it's not just to the end of the string, but to the center of gravity. So that would be the length of the pendulum. Then the period varies directly with the square root of the length. So it's a bit more complicated because I have a square root now, but it's still a direct variation. So what that says is the period is equal to a constant multiple of the square root of the length. This would be my constant of proportionality. And uh, so if I put a, if I, if I multiply the length of the pendulum by 4, if I put a 4 in here, 4L, because see the longer, the longer pendulum was 4 times as long, then that should be the period of the new pendulum. But when I reduce this, that 4 comes out as a 2, 2K square roots of L. Now, if k square roots of l was the original period of the shorter pendulum, then when I, when, I, when I quadruple the length of the pendulum, I get two times k square roots of l. So that says the period has been doubled, because I have two times the previous period. So this is a direct variation, but it involves a square root. OK, now, the, the last type of variation involves both direct and inverse variation. And uh, the example I'll use is the law of gravitation. The law of gravitation. And this was first proposed by Isaac Newton. By the way, Isaac Newton was born in 1642. That was the year that Galileo died just a moment ago. Uh, and uh, he died in 1727. Now, Isaac Newton said that if you have two masses, for example, if you have a small planet, and if you have a big planet, maybe, let's say, the sun, and they have masses, little m and big m, and if their centers of gravity, which I'll just take to be the center of each object, if the distance between them is called r, probably r for radius is what he, what he meant, then there's a force of gravitation that attracts the small planet to the big planet, and it also attracts the big planet to the small planet. So there's a certain force, or uh, there's a certain uh, certain force of gravity that attracts these two. Uh, if these weren't planets, this could be you and the Earth. There's a certain gravitational force attracting you to the Earth, and there's a gravitational force attracting the Earth to you. And uh, this would be your mass. This would be the Earth's the Earth's mass. And the r would be the distance from your center of gravity to the center of the Earth. So that'd be a little over, or right around 4,000 miles. Now, here's what Isaac Newton concluded. This force is directly proportional to the mass of the first object, the mass of the first planet, the mass of you, whatever are the, the two things we're considering. But you know, also, this force is directly proportional to the mass 
of the second object. And it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two. You know, in the pendulum problem, uh, we had a direct variation with the square root of the length. This is an inverse variation with the square of the radius. Now, if I put these three things together, I can make one compound variation out of it. And I'll say uh, little m, big M over R squared. The force is directly proportional to, or it's proportional to, or varies with little m, big M over R squared. Now the way I make that inequality, so now let's go back, the way I make that inequality is I put in a constant of variation. So F equals, I'm going to multiply by this, uh, the, sort of the, the, uh, the, the name that's normally given to the constant is G, little m, big M over R squared. And this is called the gravitational constant. So let me just write that on the side here. G, I'm not using K, but G is the gravitational constant. And it's the constant that makes the, the variation into an equality. It's the gravitational, gravitational, let's see, let me get that right here, constant. And the way you normally see this law written is to have G in the numerator, so it's big G, little m, big M over R squared. Now, I call this a compound variation because we have several things going on. F is varying directly with little m, F is varying directly with big M, and F is varying uh, inversely with R squared. So what that means is when I say F varies with little m, if you hold big M constant, if you hold the radius constant so that everything's constant except little m, and if you double little m, you'll double the mass, you double the force. Uh, same thing with uh, big M. If you leave everything else constant, little m, r, uh, if you triple big M, you'll triple the force of gravitation. On the other hand, uh, if you double the radius so that you move the objects further apart, the force will not get greater, the force gets smaller, and if you double the radius, the force will be one-fourth of what it used to be. So if you want to lose weight, what you do is just get further away from the Earth and you'll weigh less. doesn't mean your mass will change, but you, you just need to go further away from the Earth. That's the problem. Go up to the top of the mountain, top of a mountain, and you may weigh slightly, slightly less. Okay, that's called Newton's law of gravitation. Um, let's see, let me work one example of inverse variation because we really didn't get to, uh, we didn't, we didn't, we saw an example of direct variation, but I didn't work an example of inverse variation. Suppose I tell you that um, uh, X and Y vary inversely, vary inversely. Now, what that means is y is equal to k over x, or if you want, you could say k times 1 over x. Now, what if I told you a particular value that say when x is equal to 4, uh, that y is equal to 10? So when x is 4, y is 10, the question I might ask is, what is k? Well, I think if we substitute in 4 for x and 10 for y, we can solve for k. So if I put a 10 here, k over 4, then solving for k, I get k equals 40. So if I have one reading of an x and a y, I can figure out the constant of proportionality. So what this tells me in, is that the relationship is y is equal to 40 over, over x. Let's take a different one. Suppose we have a joint, vari uh, rather a compound variation where I have products and quotients. Suppose I have three variables, A, B, and C, and what if I tell you that A varies directly with B and A varies inversely with C? Now, if I put those two things together, into one statement, I would say that A varies with B over C. And this is what I refer to as a compound variation. Compound variation. Uh, I can make that an equality if I just multiply by a constant of proportionality, 
which we could write as KB over C. Now, if I have one reading of a corresponding A, B, and C, I can calculate the K. If we say, for example, that A is equal to 2, at the same time, B is equal to 5, and C is equal to uh, 20, then the question is, what would be the corresponding, uh, the, the corresponding value of K? Well, now that I have my relationship, I can plug in the numbers 2 equals k times 5 over 20. And that says that 40 is equal to 5k. Let's see, I'm running out of room. What is k going to equal? K is going to equal 8. K is going to equal 8, exactly. Now, if I go back up here to this relationship, a is equal to kb over c, I can now say a is equal to 8b over c. Some of your homework problems are going to be such that they will describe the proportion by telling you how A is related to two other variables, let's say, and they'll ask you to find K. And to do that, you'll have to have one set of readings that corresponds to each other so you can substitute those in. Well, if we summarize what we've done today, we started off by looking at functions as models for applications. We saw two examples of graphs that are used as models, and those graphs represented functions, although we didn't know the exact rule. There was the traveling salesman problem, and there was the, uh, there was the grass on the lawn growing example. And you see from those illustrations, those, illustra those graphs told a story. From the story, we could, we could tell what was happening. Then we looked at some very specific functions that model the, the perimeter of a garden, the area of a garden, um, at the, uh, the, the radar gun model. And then it, uh, we looked at, at the very end of the episode today, we've looked at some variation, at various variations. We'll see you next time for episode six.